I'm a physician by training, but all my life I've been interested in in the environment, like most Scandinavians. I try to find the area where one could develop this environmental interest together with the medical knowledge. And obviously, environmental health is close at hand. And uh, epidemiology has been rather strong, I would say, in Scandinavia for many years, partly because we have these excellent registers, cancer registries, cause of death registries, and so on. So we have excellent opportunities for epidemiological research. We have a sort of competitive edge in relation to possibilities of doing cost-effective epidemiological research. But I must add that we constantly have to defend these possibilities because there are ethical concerns, and rightly so. In recent years, unfortunately, we have seen increased hesitancy from the authorities to give us data from the registers. This is partly, I would say, an influence from the rest of Europe. And we have these new EU regulations, GDPR. I don't think it's bad in itself, and it gives possibilities for epidemiological research, but we constantly have to defend why we are doing this, the benefits of epidemiological research. I started as a physician already during med school, contacted the Department of Environmental Health at the Karolinska Institute, and I was given the possibility to look at arsenic, inorganic arsenic. We had one of the world's largest copper smelters in northern Sweden with enormous emissions of uh, sulfur dioxide and inorganic arsenic, several tons a day of inorganic arsenic. So the environment uh, around uh, this facility looked like a moon landscape. And of course, uh, people got worried, uh, what about health? And they had to uh, paint their houses uh, every second year because the paint was sort of uh, destroyed by, by the acid. And we started with uh, studies on cancer effects by inorganic arsenic. My thesis, which was completed in 1982, so that's almost 40 years ago, included experimental studies and epidemiological studies on inorganic arsenic and lung cancer because it had been suspected for quite a long time that inorganic arsenic was carcinogenic and we could show a drastic increase in lung cancer risk among workers at the copper smeltery and also some increase in the surroundings. And when we did the follow-up study a couple of years later when the emissions had decreased by 99%, we did not find such an increase. And we were able, as one of the first groups in the world, to induce lung cancer in experimental animals. It had to do with the solubility of the arsenic. Then I joined this department, and in 1981, there were two reports coming out on lung cancer and passive smoking. Women at that time, mostly non-smokers, got an increased risk of lung cancer because their husband smoked. These studies, one a Japanese study by Hirayama and one Greek study by Trikopoulos and others, they got a lot of criticism, openly or not so openly supported by the tobacco industry. They were fiercely opposing this. And it was pushing the boundaries of uh, epidemiology because the excess risks uh, were not very high. If there was some contamination by smokers, that is, some of these non-smokers who claim they were non-smokers were actually smoking. Smoking is more common if you're married to a smoker, then this could confound the results. It made us start these studies in cohorts of non-smokers. We had uh, questionnaire studies, excellent cohorts already sitting there and waiting, and we 
picked out the non-smokers from these cohorts, asked them again about tobacco smoking and followed up uh, lung cancer. And we could confirm these associations. We also studied children and uh, found uh, very strong associations between maternal smoking and wheezing bronchitis in children, not using parental reports at all, because they may be biased one way or another, but using urinary cotinine levels, that's a metabolite of nicotine. So it's an objective measure. We found exactly the same type of association between urinary cotinine and uh, the risk of wheezing. I had had some contacts with uh, sort of vested interests uh, in doing the studies around this uh, copper smelter in Sweden, because of course the company would not uh, admit to any, any health effects. So we had to uh, fight a little bit, but it was nothing compared to the tobacco industry. And I'm sure that everyone who has been involved in this research, now we take you back around 40 years or so, uh, but the older generation had, had been confronted with this. So sometimes it's very subtle actions like uh, paying off colleagues of mine at the Karolinska secretly to spy on my research. Colleagues which I trust very much or trusted. Uh, this incidentally became clear when Philip Morris had to publish numerous documents uh, because of a court ruling in uh, California. Uh, Swedish scientists were listed, my name was listed, and of course contemplated whether to sue the industry. It was known at the time that uh, the tobacco industry had the best lawyers in the world, so I decided not to do that. We've had a very active tobacco industry here in Sweden, but they quickly stopped producing cigarettes, and they produce mostly smokeless tobacco now. You are more addicted actually to nicotine uh, than when you smoke tobacco. The, the yeah. nicotine levels are higher. It's very difficult to quit using snuff. Uh, so it's been uh, promoted as an alternative tobacco smoking. So in uh, a matter of days, the Swedish tobacco industry switched from saying that uh, passive smoking is not dangerous at all to Smoking is really dangerous. Use our product. So um, the tobacco industry was very active. It's much weaker now. After that, I went on to radon research and we did the first major study on residential radon and lung cancer in the world, including some 1500 lung cancer cases and twice as many controls and and we showed very clearly a positive association. This was published in New England Journal of Medicine. So if you would ask me, uh, what results have your research generated in society? For arsenic, our research contributed to reducing the emissions from this copper smelter by more than 99%, emissions to air also to water. So it's uh, comparatively uh, clean. And then passive smoking, that's an obvious issue. I'm absolutely convinced that the research on this serious effects of uh, secondhand smoking, like lung cancer and myocardial infarction, have influenced the attitudes and measures uh, against tobacco smoking. The most dramatic effect actually is that these results and restrictions regarding tobacco smoking, uh, they have actually reduced the numbers of tobacco smokers. That has the real public health impact. And for radon, ours and other uh, studies, uh, the results were uh, clear reductions in the allowed concentrations of radon in homes. For air pollution, standards have been substantially higher in uh, Europe. I think that ISEE and environmental epidemiology has uh, strong societal uh, role. So it's important the consequences of our research. You can do things with this international research and combining evidence from different studies that you cannot do uh, on your own. But the biggest uh, advantage uh, is uh, transfer of knowledge.
by far. It has been really important for raising the level of epidemiology research. You take ideas coming from others, you use uh, state-of-the-art methods. There is nothing better for learning. I have very pleasant memories of uh, being president and working with very nice colleagues uh, across the world. I was president, I think, 1996 to 97, and I was past president in 98, meaning that I've participated in the meetings as well. And uh, we had a very nice secretariat. Uh, I would like to mention uh, Evelyn Talbot, who was the uh, treasurer secretary. Remember, there was no stable organization internally earlier. As members, I remember also uh, Gail Windham, uh, Dean Baker, Dan Wartenberg, who unfortunately passed away uh, recently. I, I learned from the IEC webpage, uh, Collins of Scolny, also my uh, successor, Tony Fletcher from the UK. So we tried to set up a sort of stable organization, uh, membership uh, dues, structure for these dues with uh, lower for students and, and so on, and deciding on where to have uh, the yearly conferences. So uh, we had monthly uh, teleconferences and our major events uh, were the yearly uh, conferences. And we've had uh, yearly conferences uh, ever since. I organized one in 1993, I think that was the fifth uh, conference in Stockholm. When I was president, there were conferences in uh, Canada and in Asia, the first conference in Asia, in Taiwan. Air pollution dominated. I was uh, very happy to see the development uh, of uh, Asian members. There were many coming uh, to Taiwan that would not have come otherwise from Japan, for example. Unfortunately, it was closed to participants from mainland China. Our conferences have been accompanied with natural disasters. In Taiwan, we had the strongest typhoon. And in Athens, of course, we had the uh, earthquake. That was one year later, I think. But we've survived. Then, of course, the society has grown to other parts of the world, to Asia, uh, South America, Africa. Uh, it's been really fantastic uh, development. And I think that uh, the International Society has had a strong role in the uh, emergence of environmental epidemiology. I was actually in the this founding meeting in 1987 in Pittsburgh. Some might correct me that I was the only one from outside North America. I was very happy to be there. I was uh, so impressed by the strong driving force, particularly from Ray Neutra and John Goldsmith. Uh, it was John who twisted my arm to organized the conference in uh, Stockholm. They were really instrumental in uh, starting this up. And history uh, shows that it was very timely. The situation was just ripe for organizing such a society.